Great. Good evening to everyone and welcome to this special event for the Blavatnik School of Government. It's um, one of our major special addresses of this year and I'm particularly grateful that the Vice-Chancellor is going to introduce tonight's speaker, so I'd like to hand over to the Vice-Chancellor. Nairi, thank you very much, and, and ladies and gentlemen, it's an enormous pleasure for me as well to be welcoming all of you to this special lecture and to be welcoming back to the university one of our greatest recent alumni. It's always wonderful when one invites an Oxford alumnus back to the examination schools, to, <laughs> to look at their face and to look at that moment of horror when they hear the clock ticking around and, and it takes them back into the, uh, into the past. But ladies and gentlemen, tonight's speaker uh, is known to all of you. Montek Singh Aluwalia is a man of, of, of towering importance in recent in the Indian history. Many of you will know that he is currently the deputy chairman of the Planning Commission for India, which is a cabinet level position that he has held since 2004. His long association with Oxford University goes back to the 1960s. He won a Rhodes Scholarship from India and came to Oxford gaining his PPE from Magdalen College and then stayed on in Oxford to, uh, to study for an MPhil in economics uh, at St. Anthony's College. But his degrees were not finished at that point because Montek returned to Oxford in 2008 when we had the great privilege of conferring on him an honorary doctorate, a doctor of civil law. Uh, he is also, among his other links and connections to Oxford, an honorary fellow of Magdalen College and a patron of the Oxford Thinking Campaign and a very, very good friend to Oxford in a guide and an advisor on issues within India and the Indian subcontinent. We have an enormous amount to thank him for. More recently, as we've heard from Nairi, in fact in 2007, the Blavatnik School of Government invited Montek to be a distinguished practitioner at the school. And this is a distinction that the school takes extremely seriously indeed, selecting from each region, each major region of the world, a key practitioner who is globally renowned for outstanding public service. And few could be as qualified for this honor as Montek Singh Aluwalia. Mr. Aluwalia began his career as an economist with the World Bank. His focus at that time was on poverty and income redistribution and that equipped him very well for his return to India in 1979. Throughout the 1980s, Montek was a key figure in India's economic reforms, the enormously important reforms that took place during that time. His role was as economic advisor in the Ministry of Finance, Finance Secretary, Commerce Secretary, and he was also on the critical group, the Economic Advisory Council, to the Prime Minister. In 2001, he was called away from India to international service, and with extraordinary support from all countries, Montek Singh Aluwalia was asked to create and to lead an independent evaluation office for the IMF. In 2004, Montek returned to India at, to head the Planning Commission, where he has been ever since. As you can hear, Montek Singh Aluwalia has made many important, indeed immense, contributions to public service, to economic policy, to economics as a subject and those contributions have been recognized widely all around the world. We are enormously proud 
to host him this evening as a distinguished practitioner of the Blavatnik School of Government and to invite him to address us. Montek. Uh, Vice Chancellor, thank you very much for that very, very generous introduction, which I don't actually deserve, but I shall savor for quite a long time. It's nice to be back, uh, as you point out. Uh, I don't think I've been in this building since I was busily writing uh, answers to questions, and it's good to be back. This is also kind of an examination, because many more people are going to have to judge what I say, uh, but it's a pleasure, and thank you, thank you all for coming. You know, I thought uh, I would use this opportunity, as the title of the lecture suggests, to just share perceptions with uh, what lies ahead for India. Uh, as it happens, uh, we in the Planning Commission and the government have just completed and published uh, the 12th five-year plan. We still have these five-year plans. They're not what most people think plans are, but they're sort of an outline of directions, the scope of, uh, of policy, problems, issues, etc. Uh, so I think I'm going to use that as a background, not, not to try to say everything that's in that 1,100-page document, but to sort of lay out some of the broad issues that I think are currently um, defining the development debate in India, and be very happy to answer questions thereafter. You know, the, the title of the 12th five-year plan, in a way, uh, symbolizes uh, what the thrust of policy is. Because the title says, faster, more inclusive, and sustainable growth. I mean, for a long time, plans have been associated with setting growth targets. And internally, while there's no doubt that growth is very important, uh, there's simply no traction uh, behind the idea that you're going to maximize GDP growth. People want to know what's in it for them. And I think what the title is trying to say is that we're not simply talking about growth. We're talking about growth that is inclusive, and I will come to the issue of what that means. And we're also talking about growth that is sustainable. It simply doesn't make sense to be talking about growth without qualifying it with those two qualifiers. So uh, the, before I talk about the subject itself, I think one point that does need to be made is that the moment you say faster, more inclusive, and sustainable growth, you really have a three-dimensional objective. And therefore, uh, somebody conceptualizing uh, what policymakers are going to make of it uh, must have in mind that they are somehow maximizing a function uh, in which these are important elements, uh, and they're using policy instruments in order to maximize this objective function. And that actually raises two sets of issues which I just want to mention uh, by way of background, not actually explore them in detail. One is that the moment you say that you have three different dimensions, I mean, any student of economics will, will say, well, clearly there are trade-offs involved. And so there's a lot of energy that's uh, dis uh, spent on discussing what are those trade-offs and what are you willing to accept. The only qualification I would put is that that is absolutely true if you were on the frontier of possibilities. But you know, as a practical matter, most countries are way interior to the frontier. So one can imagine a situation where you're pursuing objectives like faster growth, more inclusive growth, and sustainability, and you're not actually trading off one against the other, simply because you're well interior uh, to what the possibility set is. If you were on the frontier, yes, then in order to get a little bit more of one, you'd have to give up a little bit more of the other, and that would pose a lot of questions in practice. But one can legitimately say, uh, when you are not fully utilizing the possibilities, that the, you have a win-win situation. The other issue really is that uh, in order to achieve whatever you want, there is an implicit uh, assumption that you know what the different policy instruments are that will impact growth and impact inclusiveness and impact sustainability. Now, this would be very simple if each of these objectives was basically 
uh, uh, affected by one or more instruments that simply focused on that particular objective. But of course, all instruments affect all the objectives. So one needs to have a pretty good understanding of how these things interact with each other uh, in order to work out what to do at the end. And the other thing is that the number of instruments is so large in practice that they're not actually controlled by the same organization. Many people, when they talk to me, they have some sort of an assumption that the planning commission must be setting a number of instruments in order to maximize some well-defined objective function. You know, we're a federal system with three levels of government, and each level of government has different departments and ministries. And if you think of the instruments that are involved, they're distributed between what the central government can do, what the state governments can do, what the local governments can do, and within each level, they're actually controlled by different ministries. So in practice, even if we knew what's the set of policy instruments that are going to achieve the end result, it's a really quite a major job trying to get the people who control those instruments, uh, f get them to do what makes sense collectively. This is just by, I mean, I, this is what I call posing the problem. I, I really don't intend to solve the problem, but merely to suggest that it's a lot more complex uh, than it seems. Now, with that background, let me comment on each of these uh, uh, issues. And I, I've been advised by Nairi that I would do everyone a great favor by not speaking for more than 40 minutes. And I, I'll time myself to be very careful to stay within that. See, the issue of growth, the most important thing about growth in India is that India has, at least until very recently, appeared to have made a very significant transition from being a slow-growing economy to being a relatively fast-growing economy. Uh, this is, there's nothing very new about it, uh, and I won't go into all that, but basically, most of us interpret this to be the positive effect of many, many reforms that were introduced all in a rather gradualist and somewhat extended way, beginning in the early 1980s and intensified in the 1990s. Uh, when these reforms were introduced, there was a lot of doubt about whether they would be effective. Uh, in fact, most, many people said these reforms would be disastrous, they would have a very negative effect on the economy, industry would collapse, we're opening up the economy to competition, Nobody will survive, et cetera, et cetera. But that proved to be incorrect. Uh, and while it took time uh, for the e Indian economy to get to what people would call a respectable growth rate, the fact is that in the last 10 years, the economy has grown somewhere around 7.5% per annum average. And this has really been a, a little bit of a roller coaster in the sense that in the early years of the 2000s, it was modest. Then somewhere from 2003, right up to the Lehman Brothers crisis, it grew at above 9%. It slowed down in 2008, 2009, uh, like everybody else did, but actually recovered quite quickly in the next three years uh, to grow at a much higher rate. So pre-Lehman Brothers, for about five years, the economy grew at 9%. Post-Lehman Brothers, uh, it actually managed to do 8%. And then came the Eurozone crisis of 2011, which actually turned out to be, uh, have a much more debilitating effect. And the economy slowed down to 6.2% in 2011-12, and what looks like 5%, although it could be a little more, in 2012-13, which is just about to end. So the present position of the Indian economy is that it's going through a clear period of slow growth at 5%. We, of course, keep telling people that the world is going through a period of slow growth, and 5% isn't exactly the disaster that our press makes it out to be. Uh, not sure that we're convincing anybody of that, but we do point out that over the last 10 years, uh, it has been a growth rate of approximately 7.5%, and most people have tended to regard 7% as the cutoff rate for saying that an economy has actually transited to high growth, but it should have done that for 15 years. So we're not there yet. However, it is our expectation that accepting the fact that we are starting at a low point right now, 
it will be possible to bring the Indian economy back to something like the average performance that it showed in the last 10 years. So the plan is based on the assumption that we will be able to do an average of 8 percent, uh, accepting that in the very first year of the plan, which is the year that's just about to end, it's only 5 percent. Now this is only possible if you get quite a rapid acceleration and go back to over 9 percent in the last two years, which is a growth rate that was achieved before the Lehman Brothers crisis. But you know, given the state of the world economy, and I've just come back from the meeting of the G20 Sherpas in Moscow, so I have a slightly updated view of how people view the world economy in different parts of the world. It does look like a very uh, challenging task. But you know, in the past, I mean, we must separate out a purely short-term phenomenon from a country's medium to longer term growth prospects. So the most important thing on the growth front is really to, to point out that you know, if the Indian economy's uh, return to high growth were predicated on some assumption that it's going to be export led, you can rule it out because there's no prospect of rapid growth in exports for the world as a whole in the next three or four years. However, our prediction that we can get back to higher growth is not based on an export-led growth process. In fact, all around the world, uh, emerging market countries are now moving away from uh, a world in which uh, rapidly growing exports provide the impetus for growth to a world in which uh, expanding supply-side capability uh, provides the basis for that growth. So the argument is if on the domestic supply side the economy has the capability of growing faster, then demand for that expanded supply can come domestically. <clears throat> and our thinking is that that domestic source of demand should be an increase in investment and most notably an increase in investment in infrastructure. Now you know infrastructure investment has always been supported by some sort of long-term government policy. It's not something that people undertake because they immediately think they're going to make a profit. So our view is that if we can somehow orchestrate uh, a rapid expansion of investment in infrastructure in India, then India has all the other requirements to be able to grow, go back to something like 8% growth. What are those other requirements? Well, over time there's been a steady increase in the skill level of the population. Uh, if you measure it in terms of say the average number of years of schooling of the working age population, we're way behind China, but we're roughly where China was 20 years ago. And China 20 years ago grew at about 11%, admittedly on the back of a booming economy. So we have, to we have to take account of that. But I think we, we, we have put in place the sort of uh, human resource side, which I think is necessary uh, in terms of skills, a uh, bit weak on pure skill development, and I think we're trying to correct that, but certainly in terms of education. And I think we do have, uh, and this is very difficult to quantify, but we do have a very extensive broad-based entrepreneurial base. So there are a lot of people who are willing to take risks. Uh, there's a very vibrant private sector. Uh, we're not actually engaged in converting the public sector into a private sector. Many people would say that we are a bit slow. Uh, we're deliberately missing some opportunities by not privatizing, and that's true. The political constraints as perceived by the government of India are that we could allow the private sector to expand but we don't actually want to sell off public sector units and make them into private sector units. That allowing the private sector to expand is reflected in quite a substantial change in the dominance or the role of the private sector in many, many critical things. I mean, whether it's telecommunications or coal or steel or a large number of other areas uh, where earlier the system was dominated by the public sector, uh, the share of the public sector has shrunk without privatization and the share of the private sector has expanded and there's no political controversy on that. 
So the larger scope for private sector activity, I think is a very important positive. The only problem with this whole setup is basically that uh, in order to sustain a, a system in which we have rapid growth, but that rapid growth is going to be sustained on the demand side by higher levels of investment, which will almost certainly involve higher imports, but in an environment in which exports are not going to do very well, we are going to have problems with the current account deficit. And that is actually the case in India right now. I mean, we've, in the last three or four years, actually after the Lehman Brothers collapse, there's been a very big change in the macroeconomics of India. Because prior to that, uh, we were actually seeing a declining fiscal deficit, so a lot of improvement on the fiscal deficit front, uh, and a shrinking current account deficit, or at any rate, a very modest one, something like the deficit was around 1% of GDP. Uh, post the Lehman Brothers uh, crunch, there was a big fiscal expansion, which everybody did, and we did also. So the Indian fiscal deficit shot up, uh, and all, along with that, the current account deficit has also widened. That widening was, of course, in part due to hardening of uh, oil prices, it's also in part due to the fact that the expansion of the fiscal deficit meant the fall in savings, particularly government savings. So in order for the macroeconomics to work, uh, when you're trying to expand investment, we will have to finance a somewhat elevated current account deficit, at least for the next two years. Meanwhile, by reducing the fiscal deficit, we hope that the current account deficit will also shrink. Uh, and this poses the challenge that can we actually finance the kind of current account deficit that we have, it's about 4% of GDP. Now, right now, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty globally. Uh, we don't assume that this is going to continue. Uh, I think there is a certain amount of stability on the financial side. I mean, although there's a lot of uncertainty about how the global economy is going to grow, uh, the financial systems around the world appear to be stabilizing. And the key assumption here is that India will be a good bet for foreign investment. I mean, if you were a foreign investor with a lot of surplus money and you looked around the world, it's logical to think that you would look to those economies that are capable of showing high growth. Now, clearly, the Chinese economy will be the fastest growing. But there actually they have a lot of investment going on. So whether you have additional uh, profitable investment opportunities is an open question. The obvious place where you need to put more money than has been done in the past is actually India. And a lot of the uh, focus of government policy has been to try to reassure foreign investors that the place is wide open for business. I know that there have been in the last year some uncertainties created in the minds of foreign investors, whether foreign investment was indeed welcome. I think the government has taken a number of steps to correct any impression that foreign investment is not welcome. Uh, and I believe that that message is getting across. Uh, the finance minister very recently said that in the course of the next couple of months, he's going to set at rest a number of other questions that have arisen. So my expectation is that within two months or so, uh, investors would be, would perceive that this is a country welcoming foreign investment, wide open for business. And the key issue is, uh, am I right that we can get back to a growth rate of something like, we're targeting something like six, six and a half to 7% in the year 2013, 14 and then accelerate quickly beyond that. Now, some of these targets are not very, uh, in my view, whether we reach 9% or only reach 8%, uh, the broad number is, is India back to something like an 8% growth path. Uh, even if we hit it a little bit later than what we are assuming, uh, a lot of positive things will start beginning to happen. Uh, so much on the growth side. Let, let me now say a few things about inclusiveness. You know, I think in the last eight or nine years, the most important change politically at home has been a recognition that the government knows how to get growth going, but a lot of doubt on the part of many people whether the government knows how to make the growth inclusive. 
And this is a big change from what the debate was 10 years ago. Because 10 years ago, the perception was these fellows really are not going to get any growth. All these reforms are going to be bad for growth. And I think the debate changed in the last three or three or four years, saying, yes, okay, fine, the reforms are good for growth. Yes, everybody's saying that next to China, India is the fastest growing economy. But what is it doing for inclusiveness? Now, that's an issue which the government actually takes very seriously. Uh, and if you go back on the li development literature, you know, India has never, India has never pushed for the notion of growth as a nation building activity in order to become stronger, or any of those things. It's always been that we're a poor country and the only way we can significantly raise living standards for the broad mass of the people is if there's overall growth and if the growth is well distributed. I mean, a pure reliance on distributive policies would not achieve any significant gain in India for any length of time. And there's lots and lots of documentation that government policy has been based on this. But you know, for a long time, the perception has been that we lag behind uh, on the inclusiveness front. And that while we, I mean, we were rightly in many people's minds, praised for having done wonderful things on the growth front, uh, nobody was praising us for doing anything terribly wonderful on the inclusiveness front. Now, we've been trying to look at, and our position on this is that yes, it's true, that India's achievements on the growth front are much more commendable and the achievements on the inclusiveness front until relatively recently were actually modest. You know, there were extreme views which actually said that we were, uh, we were getting worse on inclusiveness. Uh, so a lot of critics would say growth is making the rich richer and the poor poorer and that's frankly a lot of nonsense. I mean, there's no evidence for that whatsoever. But it is true that the measure, the pace at which poverty was being reduced was definitely below what the government itself was targeting. The interesting thing is that in more recent years, uh, there is a lot of very good news that what we've been trying to do on inclusiveness is beginning to have an impact. So let me first say what, have we, what we've been trying to do. Uh, first point is that it has not been our approach that growth is one thing and inclusiveness is something else. It's been our view that there is growth which, if it is of a particular kind, will actually be a lot more inclusive. So the kind of growth you get matters. And probably the biggest single uh, determinant of the degree of inclusiveness of growth is whether agriculture is also growing. And I think in this respect, uh, in the 11th five-year plan, which ended last year, we have seen a very significant improvement in agricultural performance. Whereas in the 10th plan, agriculture grew at 2.6%. In the 11th plan, it grew at 3.6%. Now, you know, agriculture accounts for only about 15% of total GDP. So the difference between 2.4% and 3.6 is not something that makes a big difference directly to GDP growth, but it makes a huge difference to what happens in rural areas, including what happens to non-agricultural income in rural areas. Because higher income in the hands of the farmers stimulates more local consumption, stimulates growth in services, and a whole lot of other things where the supply capability to respond to those demands is actually there. Uh, and I think this is reflected in some very important uh, indices. Until about 2004, 2005, uh, the annual reduction in the percentage of the population below the poverty line was about 0.74% per year whereas the target the government had set was 2%. So we were constrained to point out that those who say there's no progress were obviously wrong, but we were readily admitting that the progress is not up to expectations. Now what has happened since then is that between 2004, 5 and 2011, the reduction in the pace of the, rather the pace of reduction 
in the percentage of the population below the poverty line has increased. That is, instead of falling at 0.74% per year, it's now falling at two percentage points per year, which is exactly the target which the government has set. And you know, this data have only become available in the last four months or so. Part of the problem with uh, poverty data is they come every five years. Therefore, for five years, the debate goes on and on, shriller and shriller, based on whatever the last five year data was. And this is the first time that we actually have data on whether the last five years have been better for poverty reduction than the preceding five. And the answer is unambiguous, they have been. Now that's not to say, there's a, there's a separate debate going on in India that the poverty line is too low. That is of course a perfectly legitimate issue and we've got another expert group looking at it. But we've pointed out that if you raise the poverty line, yes, the percentage below that higher poverty line will be larger. But the pace of reduction is not affected by what you do with the poverty line. So a lot of debate going on in India that the planning commission has too low a poverty. It's not a planning commission line, it's the line that the experts had recommended. But the important point to make is that the pattern of growth is more inclusive. Now, that's just one indicator. Uh, you could look at what's happening to rural consumption. Now, we have data on uh, the growth rate of real consumption per head in rural areas. Before 2004, that increased at about 0.8% per year. After 2004, it increased at 3.4%. So that's a four-fold increase in the rate of growth of rural per capita consumption. Much the same picture comes out if you look at agricultural real wages of unskilled labor. Before 2004, it grew at 1.1 percent. After 2004, at 6.8 percent. This 6.8 is partly because of uh, faster growth in agriculture partly because of government programs to promote rural employment. The, we have a very well-known national rural employment guarantee program, which is now legislated under an act. And partly because a lot of investment uh, has gone into the economy in infrastructure, especially road construction, which actually pulled a lot of labor out from agriculture into road construction, leading to a, a rise in rural wages. So those are clear indications that if you look at a recent economic performance through an equity or a distributional lens, there's good news uh, to report. And this is actually also borne out uh, by the data on what is happening to different states. You know, remember India is after all 27 states or so, uh, and each one of them has a block of MPs in parliament. So MPs in parliament are not very interested in something called GDP growth of the country. They want to know what's happening in their own state. And you know, until recently, uh, we had the phenomenon that some of the poorer states, particularly those in the central part of the country, the heartland, they were not experiencing rapid growth. The growth of the economy was largely coming from states in the north, all the states in the south and the west, Whereas this central lot were growing much more slowly. And actually in the first maybe 10 years of economic reforms, the interstate inequality actually increased. And you can see that if you look at, if you construct a measure of interstate inequality, you know, using a sort of a Gini coefficient, which just looks at interstate differences, assuming that everybody inside a state has the same income as the state uh, average, then that Gini coefficient shows a steady increase in inequality. But in the last six or seven years, that's not true. So that increasing inequality trend has uh, waned completely. And what basically the slower growing states have picked up quite substantially. So the, the different states growth rates are now converging uh, to each other. So, if you, if, you look at, if you look at regional, the regional pattern uh, of uh, uh, income growth in India, at the state level, it's actually now much more equal. In fact, the debate has shifted away from states to what's going on within a state. And many of the richer states, uh, 
now complain that we are paying too much attention to providing money to poorer states in order to get their growth rate up when there are a lot of districts in the richer states whose district growth rates are not equal to the state growth rate. You know, this is a normal process in any well-functioning, uh, at any rate, any healthy democracy that everybody represents for their own case. So uh, I think in the government of India, we're all aware uh, that progress is not made by everyone, everyone saying, you've done a wonderful job. The progress is made when the focus of attention shifts and something you were being criticized for earlier is no longer what you're being criticized for, but something else is put on the table. And that's good, that's a healthy sort of development. I think a lot of what we're seeing, frankly, on inclusiveness is an explosion of expectations, which is good, putting the government under a lot of pressure to deliver, which is good. Uh, and I think today a recognition that progress is being made but it doesn't me measure up to expectation. It's completely useless going to somewhere and saying you are living better than your parents. I think Harold Macmillan's, you never had it so good. I mean, it's absolutely true in India and it's of no consequence whatsoever. Because people are saying, how am I doing compared to somewhere else in the country? And I think we, we don't recognize adequately that uh, as a poor country, but with a huge exposure to media. I, I think there are about 200 television channels in India. Uh, so basically, uh, people are always aware uh, of both extreme successes and extreme failures. That's the only thing that the media typically cover. So we are immediately, we're all aware that there are so many Indians in the Forbes list of whatever billionaires. And we're also aware that the poorest people in the world are probably also in India. We are not at all aware that maybe two to three hundred million people may be moving from being pretty low income to being close to middle class. That's not news. So I think the government has an amazing uh, task, very difficult task, to work in a democratic environment in a low income situation where expectations are sky high. Uh, it's impossible uh, to meet all of them. But the good news is that people don't actually expect you to meet all those expectations. I think they expect you to recognize these facts, uh, to be a little apologetic if you can't quite deliver what they want. And I think they will acknowledge where progress is being made, providing you're willing to acknowledge this not good enough. And I think judged by that standard, by and large, I think people accept uh, that things have been good. The worry right now is that the growth has slowed down. And you know, while 5% may look good compared to, I mean, Europe has got zero growth and is likely to have zero growth for the next four or five years. In India, I think the kind of politics and the kind of um, dynamic that has evolved is that people are quite willing to work a little bit harder, but they really do expect growth to be between seven and 8%. So quite frankly, if we don't achieve that, they will be the devil to pay. Uh, and so I hope we do. And therefore, it's, it, it looks high. But remember, it's from a very, very low base. So on any convergence criterion, uh, I think India has the capability uh, of getting back to 8% growth. It's the current account deficit uh, that at the moment is a problem. I do believe that we can attract uh, enough foreign investment flows into India to be able to cover that deficit, because it will take a couple of years for that deficit itself, itself uh, to narrow down. So, so much on inclusiveness, but I think I want to make just one point, and that is too much of the debate on inclusiveness in India sort of focuses on what are the programs that are delivering inclusiveness. Now, actually, the strategy that we are following, and we should try to explain it more clearly than we do, is that you know, while we have a lot of programs that deliver inclusiveness, and in fact we call them flagship programs, programs for health, programs for education, programs for delivering clean drinking water, sanitation, et cetera, and we're spending a lot of money on these programs, the inclusiveness outcome is not just going to be because of these programs. The inclusiveness outcome is going to be because the growth itself, being more rapid, will also be of the kind that generates the kind of employment which seeps down 
into uh, the mass of the population. It's unfortunate that in the development literature, this is belittled as trickle down. Uh, we have to recognize that trickling, nothing wrong with trickling down if the trickle down is a flood. So the scope for policy to operate on that part of the economy, unfortunately is massively misunderstood. And we also perhaps uh, focus too much on the fact that, you know, when we are criticized, we say, well, look, we're not only relying on trickle down, we're relying on programs too. They're also important. But to my mind, it's a two, both are very important. Actually, if somebody were to quantify uh, the difference between India going from 5% to 8% and that growth being of the kind I'm talking about and the benefits that would bring to the bottom 50%, versus the benefits that come from these programs that we have, actually the former would be very, very large. I think there's also a two-way relationship. I mean, it's quite clear that a higher growth generates more revenues that enables us to fund programs on a larger scale. It's also true that the programs feed back onto growth. If you're going to educate people, if you're going to improve their health standards, give them decent sanitation, clean drinking water, which makes them healthier, that will actually lead to a higher growth rate simply because a healthy population will in fact generate a higher growth rate. So it's a two-way relationship uh, between growth and inclusiveness. And I hope that we can, I mean, that's what we try to put across. It's very difficult to judge how far we can succeed in persuading people. Uh, but I think so far, uh, they do appreciate that point. Now let me say a few words can I, to stay within the constraint. A few words on sustainability, maybe five minutes on that. You know, I think uh, this is a major, major challenge that we face uh, because it's quite clear that uh, for us to transit to high growth is going to require a far more intelligent use of natural resources than has traditionally been the case. I mean, it's quite clear, for example, in, in, in the, if you just look at energy, or you look at water, both of these are going to be major constraints on India's development. The scope for doing things intelligently in these areas is actually very large because the scope for greater efficiency, both in energy use and in water use, is very large. But quite frankly, these are really new areas and we need to bring in a combination of intelligent, regulatory restrictions and sensible price support policy. I mean, relying only on the regulatory stuff isn't going to work and probably relying only on pricing isn't going to work either. And certainly in energy, uh, the, the problems we face are very large. Uh, they're not just microeconomic problems. I mean, it's quite obvious in energy that uh, we, we are energy deficient. If we want to grow, uh, we're going to have to have a greater application of energy. Uh, we need to, we don't have the domestic energy that will fill the, uh, meet this need. So the gap between domestic and imported energy and domestic and energy supply and demand is going to expand. This wouldn't be so much of a problem if energy was freely available in the world at very low prices. It's not and it's not going to be. So therefore we need to both contain the growth of energy demand and also to expand domestic supply, particularly of the more sustainable types of energy. And uh, this actually requires putting in place a new set of policies, the contours of which are well defined, but the acceptability of which is going to require a lot of work. I mean, I'm just surprised at how many people balk at the idea that domestic energy prices should be aligned with international prices. I mean, economists simply have not succeeded in persuading the Indian public that this is actually good sense. I recall on one occasion addressing a group of our MPs and trying to make some e elementary economic arguments. And one of them got up and said, Mr. Aluwalia, are you telling me that if the crude oil price globally rises to $140, you're going to raise the petroleum and diesel prices in the country? So I sort of want to stop from saying I'm going to do it, but I had to tell him that I'm afraid there's no alternative. And this is not actually well understood. But you know, the government has taken some very important steps in that regard. Because right now, uh, 
petrol, gasoline, is actually above world prices because we tax it moderately heavily. Diesel is actually below world prices, but we have put in place a program of staged adjustment, which at the end of 18 months will completely eliminate the subsidy on diesel, providing we stay the course. That means every month, I mean, ideally, every citizen should be getting an SMS on his mobile. Now a lot of them have mobiles saying, as we told you, the diesel price has gone up by half a rupee this month also. And somehow sensitize people that this is not the end of the world. It can be done and it is being done. So far, by the way, we've done it for two months in a row. Uh, and I, I mean, we have another 16 months to go and an election that straddles that period. So there's a lot of concern whether we will stay the course or not. But on all these issues, uh, I think we need to change the discourse and sort of make people realize that this is part of sustainability. It's simply not, simply not possible to think that we're going to conserve energy and not have energy, and have energy prices subsidized. Now, uh, I'm sure that saying this in examination schools building is quite a reasonable proposition, but saying this out in the street in New Delhi is quite, di quite a different proposition, and I hope that we can do something about it. Much the same thing holds for water. You know, um, I mean, basically, India's total supply of water is the same as it was uh, 5,000 years ago. Uh, and I think we're now roughly at a point uh, where we are on average uh, kind of have the amount of water we need with deficits in some places and surpluses in others. But certainly if we grow at 8%, uh, the demand for water on a business as usual basis is going to expand way beyond supply. And the supply can only in increase a little bit. So this means a completely different approach to using water pushing water use efficiency, and once again, you get a combination of regulatory restrictions as well as price adjustment. Very difficult to do, because 80% of the water in India is used in agriculture, and we have yet to achieve uh, an appreciation that, is, that farmers recognize that we cannot be subsidizing or allowing them access to water at highly subsidized rates. So politically, that's one of the most difficult things to handle. Personally, I feel we must first get the energy thing done. It's the most important contribution that one can make for sustainability right now. And the next step would be water. Now, I could go on and on, but don't intend to. Uh, that's simply telling you where things are. I think we've put sustainability on the agenda. We're taking some tough decisions, but quite honestly, we've only just begun. I think on growth, we've done a lot, and there's a lot of confidence, and I think we can get back. I think on inclusiveness, we're just at the point where people are beginning to realize that all these different programs plus the, the trickling down is beginning to have an impact on people's lives. And I just hope that that realization leads to further strengthening of the conviction that we should continue to have sensible policy. So with those words, let me stop now and I'm happy to take questions. Hi, my name is Rohit Subramanian. I am uh, from India. I am an economics undergraduate at Oxford at the moment. Um, so my question is just with reference to the way uh, you were discussing the press in specific and the general public. A every time I go back home, my grandparents always complain about onion prices going up, fuel prices going up, and I really do struggle to explain that you know when you have a fiscal deficit, you have crowding out issues, the government has to tax people, has to cut down on expenditure. So my question to you is really, how do you go about, say, educating the general public? And this isn't necessarily the lowest of the low, the really illiterate people, the very well-educated people who don't seem to understand that you do need to pay your taxes, otherwise the government can't set in reforms, that the government does have a budget that it has to balance, and that the government does try to make everyone happy in the end of the day? So I'm from... Uh Chhattisgarh in India. I'm doing, I'm doing the BCL here at St. Peter's College. And my question relates to left-wing extremism in India and uh, the government's position on it. Does the government see it as a law and order problem only or uh, do you also see it as an economic pr problem? Because uh, uh, 
the government's position on left-wing extremism is absolutely unclear. Hello, I'm Shubham Anand. I'm in the MBA program here. Um, my question is regarding education. Recently, uh, in 2009, the government of India came out with the RT Act, the Right to Education Act. So my question is that, uh, as you very rightly mentioned, that the private sector participation should grow and should be encouraged, which is one of the policies of the government. But somehow the RTE Act comes across as if it's trying to stifle the growth of private schools, and especially affordable private schools for the yes, poor. Uh, I would like to know what is your view on that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, shall I take some yes, of these please questions? Please. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, the first one, I mean, of course, you, uh, I sympathize with your question that how do you educate people that you need to pay tax and you need to pay higher oil prices. I think that's what you were saying. Look, there's no, I mean, uh, I don't think anyone, any politician has discovered a way of persuading people that they need to pay more tax <laughs> or that they should be paying higher prices for fuel. Frankly, uh, as long as people think that, you know, everything else could be the same, uh, if they didn't have higher prices for fuel, they are quite sensible in not wanting to pay higher prices for fuel. I can understand, by the way, older people uh, tend to be most hurt by these things simply because uh, inflation of any kind, they're, they're, they're the fixed income earners. Uh, and that's true in every society. Uh, one can just hope that there are other systems of social support, etc. What worries me is the fellows who have just upgraded themselves into a more fuel efficient, car, uh, less fuel efficient car, and are resenting the fact that the fuel price increase is putting a burden on their budgets. So we have a long way to go. I think it has to be done. Government, there's no alternative. I think government must come clean. And I think if we talk frankly and seriously, we will be supported. I mean, after all, I mean, in the last two years, we have adjusted gasoline prices uh, regularly. It hasn't led to any great revolution. We've started the diesel price adjustment. And that, these two are very big, by the way. I mean, if I could be confident, if you could be confident that in something like 15 months from today, India will have eliminated the subsidy on diesel, that would be a major breakthrough. You know, on the issue of uh, need to pay tax, I think it's going a little too far to put the onus on individuals to, I think you ought to have a tax system which basically encourages people to be honest. And that means modernizing the tax system big time and making sure that those who don't pay uh, uh, find is not worthwhile. And I think we're moving in that direction. You know, on personal income tax, uh, the record in India is quite good because the ratio of personal income tax to GDP has been steadily rising. Where we're not good is on indirect taxes. And there, the game changer is going to be the introduction of the goods and services tax. Now, uh, those of you who follow the Indian uh, events probably know that this cannot be done without a constitutional amendment, okay? Uh, and we are, we're now closing the gap between the different parties on this issue. Uh, my suspicion is that, you know, since we need to close, the, we need to get the cooperation of the parties that are currently in opposition, but which are in power in many of the individual states. A, a constitutional amendment requires the states to be on board. And I think that that difference is narrowing. It may be a tactical issue that since there's an election due next May, uh, many opposition parties want to stretch this out a little bit uh, so that it doesn't happen uh, before that or if it happens so late that they will both claim that you know they cooperated, it's not a victory of one lot over the other, which is fine. Uh, but the present prospect is that in the year 2014, we will have a goods and services tax. That will be the first introduction of a genuine universal base VAT system in India, with the states and the center having parallel uh, taxes on the same uh, items. I mean, it'll be a game changer in terms of uh, revenue efficiency. So I think on the fiscal side, that's the single most important thing that we need to do. That and getting energy prices right, quite frankly, are the two most important reforms uh, that we should be aiming at. Um, on left-wing extremism, 
is it an economic problem uh, and the government's position is not clear? You know, I mean, no political problem is ever only an economic problem, but there's no question that uh, left-wing extremism feeds on not just, I think, economic deprivation, but these are areas, forested areas, where, you know, on the one hand, they're they are occupied by what we call tribal groups, and they're areas where economic activity hasn't sort of, uh, has not only has not blossomed, but there are a lot of controls over it blossoming, because there's also a feeling that you shouldn't disturb the forests, you shouldn't disturb the traditional tribal lifestyle. So there's a bit of a, people are conflicted on what to do in this area, and as a result, these are not areas that have seen any of the eight and nine percent growth that I talked about. Now, feeding, feeding on that and the perception that you're being left behind, there's, economic, there's this left-wing extremism. Government is very clear, by the way, that we need to tackle this in, on two fronts. I mean, the, if somebody takes up arms against the state, you cannot simply say, well, we're not really going to oppose that, but we're going to put in schools and roads, etc. So we're saying we're going to put in schools and roads, etc. But extremist groups have to be encouraged to get into the mainstream. Now, the government has very recently, by the way, announced some kind of an amnesty with a huge amount of money. So any, anybody who's in the extremist leadership uh, is being encouraged to give up their arms and sort of join the mainstream. So it has to be a two-stage operation. There should be no doubt in anyone's mind that the government of India is not complacent about left-wing extremism. We're not taking the view that it's going to disappear automatically. It's a very disruptive force. Uh, but I think we think that uh, sort of using this two, two-legged strategy will actually contain and ultimately deal with it. But we have to recognize that these are, I mean, you know, this is, uh, you, you, have, you have to have a strategy that wins them over rather than a sort of, these are not insurgents invading the country from somewhere else. So there's an element of, uh, of balancing, uh, but I don't think there's any lack of clarity on what outcome we want uh, in that area. Um, the last, the third question, I mean, uh, I heard you were saying that there are aspects of the Right to Education Act which you feel uh, seem like they're anti-private schools. Uh, I'm not aware what exactly you have in mind. I mean, the, the Right to Education Act simply makes it a legal obligation on the part of the state to provide free schooling to anybody through the state school system. It also imposes an obligation on every private school to take in 25% of the total uh, number of students from the poorer groups uh, without charging them a fee on the assumption that the government will reimburse the school at the rate at which it would have spent on these kids if they were in a public school. But since most of the private schools uh, are at a higher cost, uh, there is an element of cross-subsidy that is built in, in the sense that the other children's parents will get charged more in order to make up the gap. Uh, I'm not aware that that, I mean, unless you feel this 25% is a wrong thing to do, I wouldn't interpret this as an anti-private sector school. There's one other dimension which I know has been in the press. You know, the um, Right to Education Act lays down minimum, uh, if you like, criteria that a school must meet in order to be registered. It must have whatever classrooms, uh, enough for the students, and so many teachers per student, and playing fields. Now, you know, all the well-established private schools, the upper income type of private schools, actually have that, so they don't have a problem. But there is a phenomenon of, um, you know, informal private schools, uh, which some people deride as teaching shops, but to which poorer people prefer to send their children in the belief that they're getting taught better than they are in the public sector. And a strict application of the Right to Education Act would require these schools to be shut down. Now, uh, I've talked to the Minister for Human Resource Development. I don't know how they're gonna handle the problem. Maybe they'll give them more time. But it is a problem, it is a genuine problem. But on the other hand, you know, 
uh, you can't you can't sort of assume uh, that uh, because people don't want to send their children to public schools and are willing to send them to substandard private schools, that the right of those private schools to exist uh, should continue, uh, even if they don't meet what are said to be minimum standards. Frankly, I think what the government should do, and I think we are now doing that, is to bring in public-private partnership in building public schools. And there is a program which they have just launched where there are going to be so many model schools and private sector people in education are being asked to come in and help to run these public sector schools. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but if there's something else which you think sounds anti-private sector on schooling, let me know. Uh, hi, my name is Orgo Sengupta. I'm a lecturer in the law faculty and a default student. Uh, my question was about uh, managing expectations as the growth process goes forward. And uh, recently in an article last week uh, in The Guardian, Slavoj Zizek, the left-wing commentator, while talking about the philosophy of rebellion, uh, had a rather insightful quote which I think worked for India. And he said that rebellion doesn't happen because things are bad. It happens because expectations are high and they're disappointed. And uh, it seems that as we are going forward and the growth story continues and the media which you referred to um, portrays this growth story and also instances of crony capitalism and so on, how, my question is how do we manage expectations more specifically if this inclusive growth which has uh, a lot of bad press as well doesn't happen in the way you think it would happen. So I don't, I'm sorry to sound a little cynical, but what's plan B in terms of managing expectations if inclusive growth doesn't happen at the pace you wish it did? Thanks. Great, thank you very much. Sorry. Elizabeth Roberts from the... It's working if you point From it. the Weidenfeld program. Um, I, I was interested in the... Um, National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, which seems a very apt uh, instrument for inclusiveness. But I wonder when you evaluate the effect of this sort of policy, whether you disaggregate the benefits. I'm thinking, for example, that an act like this might lead to um, substantial benefit in child nutrition or in reducing infant malnutrition, but might at the same time negatively impact perhaps on the health of women who might, because of having to carry out um, the paid employment, but also continue with domestic duties, um, find that the impact was negative. So do you have a fine-tuned method of evaluation for this sort of program? Thank you. No, um, can I answer that? Sure. I mean, you know, on the issue of managing expectations and how do we manage expectations, uh, I mean, that sounds a little manipulative, you know, people are going to expect too much, so how do we manage them? I think politicians know, uh, know how to cope with that problem. The most important thing to recognize is, you know, if the expectations were a dysfunctional phenomenon, then incumbent governments would not be voted back no matter what they do. But that's not been the experience. I mean, at the national level, the UPA government was re-elected in 2009, and clearly its performance between 2004 and 2009 by any standard was the best performance in five years in terms of growth. And we didn't have the data at the time on inclusiveness, but clearly the people knew something about what was going on. So while they had these expectations, and they're quite happy to say the government isn't doing enough, they did elect them back. And if you look at individual states, the general perception is that states where governments have delivered broadly in what is called the development agenda. It's not the case that expectations overshot achievements and so governments were thrown out. Governments have got re-elected. So I think that, and what's his name, uh, Arvind Panagriya has, has written a piece recently doing a lot of detailed analysis. If governments judged to be performing well developmentally are being re-elected and the expectations phenomenon is across the board, that means that people manage their voting behavior uh, independent of their expectations. It makes good sense for them to put pressure on the government all the time, saying you fellows aren't doing enough, and at the same time vote for governments that actually do something. So I don't see that as a, as a big problem. I think what happens though is that, you know, uh, uh, 
activist groups uh, that are that constantly point to the government uh, not sort of coming up to what they expect tend to sort of focus a bit too much on what is I mean the glass being half full or the glass being half empty but frankly the electorate seems to be able to judge uh, so I don't see that as a huge it's not beyond the realm of uh, the Indian democratic process to handle that problem in my view um, on the issue of uh, the national rural employment, that's an interesting point. I mean, what you're saying is that uh, we know that women uh, benefit from it, quote unquote benefit, in the sense that they, they get a lot of employment under these programs. When asked, they're very happy with the programs. A lot of effort has gone into eliminating gender discrimination in the sense that uh, women are being paid uh, for the effort put in and not necessarily, I mean, the physical fact that a woman working full-time will move less earth than a man is not leading to her getting less wages. But what you're saying is that somehow the fact that they're being tempted into work might be leading them, A, to neglect their children, or B, to do something that's harmful to their own health. It's certainly a legitimate question. Uh, I've not seen that. Uh, actually evaluated but you know we are under uh, we are about to undertake um, in the planning commission a major evaluation of this program we do that periodically anyway and i think that's worth putting in the problem of course would be what is the control group uh, i mean remember these are the poorest women I mean, nobody else would come and take these programs so it's a little difficult to set up a test of what would have been their health condition if they didn't go into the program and didn't earn the money that the program provided. But I think it's a, it's a, it's a legitimate question and I will check with our people whether some thought is going into that or not. Nick Gowing um, with BBC World News. Um, two questions. You've talked about the growth ambitions, but there are big costs to growth, particularly when it comes to cities and pollution. And I was in Delhi only recently, just walking along the river, and to see the incredible volumes of black nastiness coming out of pipes. And I'm saying that because it's all very well having growth, but there's an enormous social and industrial cost to this. And I'm wondering how much in your planning now you are embedding regulation, good governance, in order to make it livable in India in the future, in the big cities, and you know the figures better than I do, of, of where population is going and the urbanization, but the, 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 the price, particularly in water, in a place like Delhi, where you see it literally, it's more, more or less biologically dead, the river now. Secondly, when you say that there, you're convinced that foreign direct investment is going to come back and it'll be much better in two months' time, what about the shadow still hanging over from the Vodafone case, from the licenses for the telecoms um, uh, contracts, which were all revoked? Those kind of things have left a, lot, a big memory in those who might be tempted to invest in India. And of course, there's the issue of corruption, which Anna Hazara has put on the agenda, even though politically it's, it's become a confusing issue. Well, thanks, Nick. Um, predictably good questions. Um, <clears throat> on, on the water issue, uh, I think, as I said, uh, we've only just begun. And I agree with what you said that uh, the extent of pollution of our freshwater resources, uh, we've come to realize only in the last two or three years that not only that it's a serious problem, but that the instrumentalities that we were using earlier to fix the problem aren't working. Because you know we had a program uh, to clean the Ganga way back in 1985, uh, but infirmities in the way it was structured meant that a lot of uh, sewage treatment plants got set up. Uh, they very often didn't work. Uh, they didn't work because uh, the, the municipalities didn't, didn't charge enough for sewage uh, to be cleaned, uh, weren't able to provide the money from their budgets, as a result of which these plants weren't able to pay their electricity bills, as a result of which the electricity bills got discontinued, and basically you were back to where you were earlier. Now, I think uh, you asked the question, are we doing something in our planning? In the planning, I assure you, we are. But to move from planning to get it implemented, I mean, this is really the big issue because 
virtually all uh, the instruments for control are really with the state governments and not with the central government. So we have to do uh, a bit of hectoring, a bit of incentivizing, a bit of linking our financial support to action in order to get uh, the pollution problem sorted out. And I think we're planning to do that. Delhi is a particularly bad example. You know, the problem is that 45% uh, of the population of Delhi is not actually connected to the sewage system, to the sewers. As a result, although we have sewage capacity, it's underutilized. So the sewage actually flows through open drains into stormwater drains, pollutes the river. Now, Delhi is trying to fix that problem by creating a system of intercepted, uh, until the sewerage system itself can be fully extended, you know, to create a system of intercepted drains where this sort of stuff is intercepted before it gets into stormwater drains and taken to uh, a sewage treatment plant. What we in the Planning Commission are suggesting is that the costing of water should be on a holistic basis in the sense that water, the cost of water should be the cost of drawing the water from a fresh water support source and returning cleaned water to, the, to some fresh water source. It's not enough to cost the water in terms of what it takes to put it into the distribution system and don't actually cover the cost of the sewage uh, treatment that's involved. Now, this, the, the problem at the moment is that only about uh, uh, 30 percent of the maintenance cost of or around 30 to 40 percent of the maintenance cost of delivering water is actually recovered through water user charges and sewage is not included in that at all. Now this is fine if the municipality wants to give a subsidy and can actually give a subsidy and subsidize the sewage whereas in our view you should take a holistic view of the system say this is what it costs, give the poor a minimum supply of water, whatever the base level is, and beyond that, load the entire cost of both the water and the sewage treatment onto those who draw water, including commercial users. This is going to require even more uh, persuasion of people than the fuel price hike. Uh, as a matter of fact, right now, one of our social activists in Delhi uh, has uh, declared that he feels that the regulator is putting, allowing the regular distribution companies to charge too high a price for electricity uh, and is going on some kind of a demonstration fast to draw attention to this inequity. The leading opposition party in Delhi has announced that if they get re-elected, they're going to cut the distribution of electricity charges by 30% which will almost certainly drive the system bankrupt. Uh, I'm sure it won't happen, but there's a huge education job to be done. And that's electricity, by the way. Water is a far more, I mean, a lot of people say things like water is a basic necessity. And what we say is that, look, so many liters of water per capita per day, per household per day, per month is a basic necessity. So let us price that at a ridiculously low level but then recover the total costs from the total water supply to all the people who are washing their lawns and whatever, watering their lawns and washing their Mercedes cars and this, that and the other. But we haven't yet managed to get social activists to say that we should do full costing of water plus sewerage, very low charges for the first so many liters per month and then slap the rest on. Uh, that's what the planning fellows are saying. By the way, the, one of the interesting ideas that some people have raised is the best thing to do in Delhi would be to ensure that all the sewage, treated sewage is discharged upstream of the river and not downstream. Now, it's actually quite a cute idea because nothing would convince people more importantly of the need to clean up this stuff. That's a different state. Hmm? Well, yeah, you could technically, uh, you could do it just upstream in Delhi itself. But anyway, uh, it's, I think it's something on which there hasn't even been an adequate, uh, not been an adequate public debate. But here in India, 
when things do get, it just takes long time. So my view is energy is very thoroughly debated and I'm hopeful that in two years time, we will look a lot better on energy. I think in the next three years time, there'll be huge debates on water. And whether we can solve that problem or not, uh, we will see. But there's no dearth of focusing on that issue. It's, it's, it's very much there now in the newspapers. People are aware of it. And let's see how it goes. But it is a, it's an extremely important thing. On the FDI and the Vodafone case, you know, um, the Vodafone case didn't do us any good. Hmm? And the phone Well, yeah. The tel OK, let's first look at the Vodafone case. Uh, it happens to be an individual company. But I believe the finance minister has said that they are in some negotiations to see whether some reasonable compromise can be worked out. I have no idea what they're talking about. But obviously, if we can put that behind us, that would be a good thing. I think Vodafone seemed to recognize that, you know, my own view, by the way, is that uh, they knew very well that this was chargeable to tax and took a calculated risk. Frankly, I think they should have told whoever they paid the money to that, look, this is clearly chargeable to tax. So we're going to pay the tax and give them the net uh, the difference. Anyway, they took a calculated risk. They won. Then we did this thing. And hopefully, it will sort itself out. It's not, uh, it, it, it wasn't something that helped. Uh, but I believe that uh, there's a good chance that we may have that behind us. Now, as far as the telecom, uh, the cancellation of the licenses by intervention of the Supreme Court, I mean, that is something, it's not a government action. Uh, what the court did, actually, was to say you shouldn't have given this, uh, these licenses at a historically determined price. You should have auctioned them. And what they're doing now is they are, in fact, auctioning them. Uh, and uh, the market is going to determine what the price is. True that, the, that those who had the licenses canceled do feel that it is uh, unfair. But the longer term impact uh, would be the introduction of very clear and transparent rules on how these things should be allocated so that they would actually be beyond question. So I'm hoping that although it is an irritant, it's part of the evolution uh, towards a system where scarce resources are being allocated or rather made available through a tra transparent market determined pricing system. Um, so I'm hopeful that uh, if you were to ask the same question a year from now, you would come to the conclusion that that was a blip, uh, but the telecom story is a good one. But that's, that's my hope and expectation. Hi, uh, I'm Vrinda. I'm studying, uh, I'm reading for the BCL as well. Uh, I was just wondering, coming to what you said in terms of the relationship between the Supreme Court now and the government, because the Supreme Court is being seen as increasingly interventionist, whether it was in the 2G case or even right to food litigation, and you know, encroaching in policy areas. Is that a consideration which is taken into account while planning? Or is it, is there, has that made any difference in terms of the relationship between the executive like, and the planning and the Supreme Court's role as being increasingly interventionist in policy areas? And I was wondering if that's a consideration which um, is something you think about while making any of these plans. That's a dangerous kind of question, no? Because uh, it's sort of a, I'm not sure that I'm allowed to say that the Supreme Court is intervening in policy. <laughs> the, the Supreme Court would simply say that it's uh, interpreting the law. I feel, by the way, that uh, I just want to, I mean, I noticed you said you're doing a BCL. So, you know, uh, I'm very aware that economists really don't have much understanding of the law. Uh, and therefore, I'm, I'm sort of I'm aware that I'm getting into a difficult area. But my feeling is that at the Chief Justice level, many statements have been made that you know while the court has an extremely important role in laying down the law, and the law obviously is something that constrains policy, it has never been the view of anyone in the court that they're supposed to lay down policy. Of course, you know, what you've got is a very activist uh, public interest litigation group that invariably question every act of policy on the grounds that it violates some requirement of law. 
But the, there's a bit of a change in that. I mean, take the telecom licenses issue. The government deliberately uh, took the stand at that time that we're not challenging the decision of a two-judge bench to negate these licenses on the grounds that they were somehow improper. But we went back to the court to ask the question, explicitly saying we're accepting this, to ask the question, uh, do we have the freedom to decide how licenses should be allocated or should they always be done through auction? And a five-judge bench clearly said no. Uh, it is for the government to decide, but you ought to have good reasons for whatever you choose. So to my mind, that gave a signal which the government can read later on uh, in a particular way. And I think very recently there was a Supreme Court judgment on a PIL which said that some hydroelectric project which had been given environmental clearances, someone came and said, well, no, no, these clearances are improperly given, they shouldn't have been given, is damaging the environment, this, that, and the other. And the Supreme Court actually threw it out on the grounds that we don't understand what's going on in this country. Everybody wants power, but nobody wants a power project. So, you know, they're beginning to, they're beginning to give a signal that don't think that we are there to simply interrupt everything that happens. So I'm not so unhopeful uh, on that front. Uh, hello, I'm Jaime Gorenstein from the Brazilian Development Bank. You mentioned right in the beginning that investment in infrastructure is one of the drivers to achieve faster economic growth. And my question is how you're dealing with the issue of long-term financing for infrastructure yeah. projects <clears throat> and how you are mobilizing the various sources, both domestic and international sources of funding. And also I'm interested in your views about the proposed BRICS Development Bank. Um, yeah, you made the very important point in your lecture that uh, the way to, that as important as, as, employ, as these programs, uh, the way to achieve uh, inclusion is labor intensive growth, the nature of growth. I mean, that's, that, that's absolutely right. But you also said <coughs> um, the world has changed we can't do what the East Asian countries did. They did it via exports. Okay, so that leaves then the question of how do you do it without going down that route. Uh, the development literature used to say you do it by moving people from the informal sector to the formal sector. Now, if you look at India, the size of the informal sector in, as, a, as a proportion has not changed for 20 years possibly for 40 years. Um, so, uh, can you just reflect on that question? I mean, how do you, what do you do about this? Okay. Uh, I mean, you did say agriculture, I, I give you that, but this, it's wider than that. Okay, okay. Um, let me, a quick, quick response to both, you know, uh, on, the, on investment, I mean, you very rightly pick on the, what I would say is the, the Achilles heel of the argument. Uh, will we be able to generate uh, the long-term finance, especially since this long-term finance should be in domestic currency? I mean, you can't be having large volumes of infrastructure investment uh, financed through foreign currency denominated borrowing. Now, obviously, uh, a critical element in this has to be the reduction in the fiscal deficit, because at the moment what is happening is the large fiscal deficit is simply absorbing virtually, at the present moment, is virtually absorbing all the saving surplus coming from the household sector. The corporate sector, of course, is generating savings which other people in the corporate sector are using. So the big change is going to be one more domestic saving. Hopefully, uh, lower rates of inflation will lead to more savings going into the financial system uh, and out of things like gold, etc. And of course, a lower fiscal deficit will mean government releasing a lot of money, which otherwise they absorb. So that'll be a very important support. I think there are also regulatory changes that are being talked about. Now, I don't know how that will work, because part of the problem with long-term finance is that uh, if you have an infrastructure company that is actually uh, uh, part of a large group, but doesn't itself have a good enough credit rating, and how does it float the kind of bonds which, let's say, an insurance company can pick up? So a lot of work is being done, not only by us, but actually globally, on how to, how to resolve this problem. 
it is, it is I think, a big problem. But right now in India, the, the real problem with infrastructure is that, you know, many large infrastructure projects have got stuck uh, for lack of environmental and other regulatory clearances. So actually we need to get rid of that problem and we, are, we have set up a cabinet committee which is explicitly empowered to do that. So I think the next step for us is to get rid of these problems so that a large number of projects work. But then we'll run into the, the financial constraint. And hopefully some of these other things that I've talked about will have come into play. Uh, we feel, by the way, that this is an area where the multilateral development banks could help big time. Because it's the most obvious market failure in the system. And you know, we've been saying that in particular, since we are not anymore trying to push uh, infrastructure solely on the basis of government finance infrastructure. We're encouraging a lot of public-private partnership. So it's very illogical for us to be borrowing from the World Bank on a government guarantee and lending this money to private sector projects. We've been encouraging the World Bank to sort of do some sensible uh, credit assessment of its own and lend directly to public, uh, uh, infrastructure projects in the public-private partnership space. But unfortunately, the bank is not actually primed to do that. And I think there's a second problem, and that is the capital of the bank is inadequate. And in the G20, this is the issue that we keep raising. That, you know, if the, if the G20, if the industrialized countries are really serious, that to compensate for the, what Vijay described as the loss of export expanding potential, which has a negative effect on developing countries, one of the ways they can, they can offset that is to recapitalize the World Bank in order to allow innovative financing of public-private partnership-based infrastructure projects. We're not having any success in persuading anyone on this, but I think that, to my mind, very important. The argument they don't want to do that is that there's no money. But you are in, we are in a ludicrous position where trillions of dollars are being spent through some QE3, QE4, God knows QE5, but you're not willing to put another 50, 100 billion into the MDBs in order to finance what would undoubtedly lead to a major stimulus for spending around the world. And it's something we keep raising. Uh, and I hope that, uh, well, we need to persuade the BBC and the Financial Times to, <laughs> to support us on that one. It's a very important. I'm glad you raised the issue. It is a weak spot. Uh, and there are things we could do. To, to correct that. Um, uh, Vijay, you, you know, you're right, of course, that you know, um, everybody else was able to cash in on the uh, labor-intensive export bus. That bus isn't going to be turning up as frequently as it was earlier. Yes, you know, our view is, first of all, that you know, the scope for doing that kind of manufacturing, feeding domestic demand is higher now given their incomes are higher. It's higher because in South Asia, Southeast Asia, a lot of these countries are now growing reasonably rapidly and openly. I mean, India signed a free trade agreement with the ASEAN. So if the whole ASEAN region kind of grows at six and 7%, uh, that, uh, given their income levels, that provides us with some, somewhat more export possibilities. Um, I agree that on moving from the informal to the formal sector, that's been a weak spot in our performance. And I feel that one of the reasons it hasn't happened is that India has been a poor performer in providing infrastructure for manufacturing. You know, the logistics, the speed of movement, good quality power, that sort of thing. Uh, a lot of our industry is there at the higher end, but we don't have a good enough environment where a bright entrepreneur would immediately want to expand in a manner where he would employ 2,000 people. I mean, a lot of the, the smaller, they're, they're at the below 50. And then you have the big companies. And we don't have anybody. We ought to be having many, many more companies employing between 100 and 500 people. And that space is highly constrained. Uh, how much of that can be kind of done domestically by just the formalization of the system? How much of it could be done by integration with uh, East Asian demand? Those are. Those are open, open issues. But I do agree that that's an important point. Well, um, Deputy Chairman, you've laid out a clear um, goal. 
of growth that's um, faster, more inclusive and more sustainable. And I think your every answer to every question has highlighted to everyone in the room just how difficult it is to be in government, just how difficult it is to get things done. And that's the problem that the Blavatnik School of Government has been created to address. It's a problem we're trying to address through educating future leaders, by creating global networks of outstanding policy makers, and by doing practice-facing research that actually helps provide some practical answers to government. We wouldn't be able to do any of that without the support, the advice, the brilliant teaching of so many people in this room. And I just want to thank you all for that. Um, and most of all, I'd like you to join with me to thank Montec for his support for the school. Um, and for a day, we have, we have used every minute of his day <laughs> um, as, a, as a community here at Oxford um, to take advice and to, to have him helping different parts of the university. So could you join me in thanking him tonight? <laughs> <laughs>